Well, uh, this audience certainly uh, needs no reminding about all this happening in the Middle East, a region at times contradictory, often dangerous, always challenging. You and Israel leave, live uh, those perils day to day, and those of us uh, who see them from a distance can never quite capture what it means to experience them up close. Still, I think it uh, would be useful for me to describe briefly how the region is seen uh, from the United States and how that affects our thinking and molds uh, our choices. Over the past several years, the Middle East has been undergoing unprecedented turmoil marked by overlapping conflicts. There is, of course, the defiance uh, shown by large portions of the Arab people against autocratic, corrupt, um, sclerotic regimes, a series of uprisings we first viewed as an Arab Spring. But it soon became clear that among those vying for different future, there is a f fierce competition for what that future should look like, whether it will be more Islamic or less. Islamists themselves are in the throes of a brutal, bloody battles uh, among sectarian, tribal, uh, and ethnic uh, uh, sides. There's a generational clash fueled by youth unemployment uh, and social media, and an urban-rural divide fed by the marginalization of groups uh, and the concentration of power in the hands of a few elites. At the national level, borders drawn a century ago are being diluted uh, and as supranational loyalties gain precedence over national ones and large portions of the region become ungoverned. And overlaid upon this shifting mosaic, a regional tug of war between Iran and Saudi Arabia plays out in Syria and Iraq, in Lebanon and Yemen and Bahrain. The alliances of convenience that have emerged in the midst of this are enough to give you geostrategic vertigo. Iran uh, fights alongside the Alawite regime in Syria while backing Hamas that was born of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Saudis vow to crush the Muslim Brotherhood but back uh, Islamic Salafists in Syria and elsewhere. The U.S. works with Maliki to, to defeat Al-Qaeda in Iraq, while Maliki supports the Assad regime we believe has lost legitimacy to lead. Now, I draw this portrait for, for two reasons. First, uh, at an elemental level, it dictates a sense of humility. If the battles are as complex and interwoven, if what is at play is not a mere debate between democracy and autocracy, as some thought in those early days of 2011, but a debate at least in part about the political meaning of nationhood and of Islam, those issues will not be decided in Washington or outside of the region. They will be decided by people in the regime, in the region, and for the region. But at the same time, these complexities should not be used in my country to throw up our hands in bewilderment and fail to define in the midst of this, these messy cross-currents, our national interests, 
and to pursue them together with others with as much commitment and energy and clarity as we can because we have clear and compelling interests in the outcome. It matters to us whether the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant have a safe haven in Syria from which it can launch attacks on us and our friends and prepare a new generation of jihadists. It matters to us if Iran is emboldened uh, so to, as to project uh, power, uh, uh, particularly uh, if it has nuclear weapons. It matters to us whether Arab societies move, however slow and however cautiously, toward more representative and inclusive forms of government, or whether, conversely, they remain mired in unrepresentative, exclusionary rule that provides fertile ground for extremists to prosper. It matters to us if instability in the region triggers a spike in oil prices. Yes, we're striving for energy independence, and that is a good thing because it will make us more competitive and improve our balance of payments and our fiscal position. But it will not diminish our dependence on oil from this region one bit. Oil and gas are global commodities. The, they, the, the price of oil and gas is a world price. Even if we did not import one drop of oil from this region, uh, if the supply was interrupted, uh, that would affect our trading partners in Europe and Japan, and it would damage the global economy. And it matters to us whether Israel is threatened or secure, caught up in conflict or in peace. For our interest in this nation and its welfare is deeply routed and rooted with the American people across the political spectrum. It is not paranoia for Israelis to feel threatened in this environment. It is a combination of realism and history. So the challenges facing America's Middle East policy certainly is to know our limits in a treacherous landscape but is also not to be paralyzed by them. We need to find that strategic space between necessary humility and indispensable activism. We cannot be masters of the Middle East destiny, but just as surely we cannot now turn our backs on this region, allowing its problems to fester, it is a surefire way of allowing them to grow uh, and come back to haunt us. Finding that balance uh, is best explained, I think, and done on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and that's what I propose to do uh, next. Let me start with Syria. It has not been at the top of your agenda over the last few days, but as former UN Peace Envoy Lakhtar Brahimi said yesterday, it poses a grave threat to the future of the Middle East. Syria is a microcosm of the currents I described earlier. The fight against an indescribably brutal ruler fought along sectarian lines between more mainstream Islamists and jihadists, all in the context of a struggle for regional influence between Iran uh, and Saudi Arabia. The argument in the United States that Syria is too complicated, too messy, uh, too muddled for us to get involved has, over the past three years, 
held the United States back from energetic engagement. All slopes have seemed to be slippery ones. Currently, we have, certainly we have learned over the past decade that Americans should not fight wars in lands we dimly comprehend and whose destinies we only marginally can shape. But that doesn't mean there is nothing to be done at all. We cannot afford to be spectators in this unfolding tragedy whose effects are felt across the region. In Syria, moral imperatives and strategic interests converge. The continuing hemorrhage of refugees that strains Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, a jihadi safe haven in eastern Syria with growing numbers of Western fighters, many of whom will return home with the worst of intentions. The risk that Iran and Hezbollah emerge empowered and emboldened, ready to set their sights on higher goals, and a human tragedy of unimaginable proportion, where killing innocent civilians with bombs and rockets and chemical weapons is not an unfortunate consequence of war. It is the deliberate strategy of Assad's war. In addition to the millions that have been killed and displaced, an entire generation of Syria's youth may be lost. So what can be done? Let me suggest a few things. We can increase our support for vetted opposition fighters with equipment and training that will help them protect their own people, like weapons that can shoot down helicopters, dropping barrel bombs uh, on schools uh, that house their children, that can help them challenge the jihadists, and they can help put Assad back on the defensive. And we should consider other ways to degrade Assad's air power, a decisive advantage against a civilian population. In the so-called liberated areas, the international community can pay police to maintain order and pay teachers to go back to school and pay administrators to maintain a semblance of stability. And on the humanitarian front, while the UN agencies do heroic work, they're dependent on approval from the Assad government as to where they go. While well, hundreds of thousands of people, many starving, are out of reach. We need to push more aid across Syria's borders, even if that means going around uh, the UN. As many of us have argued for some time, the potential for influencing events in Syria was greater three years ago, two years ago, one year ago, than it is today. But it will not be greater one year from now. The strategic situation in the region will be worse, and the human cost will be higher. The risks of action are always easier to imagine than the risks of inaction. If Syria is messy, America's interest in Iran could not be clearer. We have an enormous interest in ensuring that the Islamic Republic will not be in a position to threaten our allies, Israel, first among them, either directly or through proxies. And we must be clear-eyed about the threats that would be posed to Israel, to the region, and to overall stability by a nuclear Iran and by our failure to take adequate measures to prevent it. A nuclear Iran will lead to a nuclear region. We should harbor no illusions about the nature of the Iranian government. Certainly the election of Hassan Rouhani is a promising development, but it was not the political equivalent of a heart transplant. There's no evidence that the 
fundamental ambitions of the government have changed. Supreme Leader remains at the helm. The face of, of Iran to the region is not Rouhani. It is the commander of the Revolutionary Guards, Hassan Soleimani, who drives Iran's effort to prop up Assad, to stir up unrest in the Gulf, and to foster unremitting hostility to Israel. Even if we can resolve the nuclear issue in a satisfactory way, none of those other issues go away. The United States and our friends and allies will need to be vigilant and prepare to oppose Iran's aggressive behavior. But Iran's ability to intimidate and coerce will be diminished. Here I think the Obama administration has acted strategically and prudently. First, it assembled and maintained an unprecedented international sanctions coalition. Not just of countries that felt threatened by an Iranian nuclear program, but those who didn't. I talked to many governments, officials from Japan and South Korea and India and China, as they were being pressured to cut back on their purchases of Iranian oil. For some, more than 30% of their oil came from Iran. I could tell you they were not pleased. President Obama, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Steinberg, and Kerry were relentless. They made this a fundamental matter of our bilateral relationship. Second, the P5 plus 1 negotiations have been extraordinarily detailed and painstaking, very specific, and reflective of the concerns of our allies. By keeping Russia and China engaged, despite our, strand, our strains on many other issues, we've kept them on board the sanctions regime. I know the American negotiator very well. She was my business partner. Let me assure you one thing. She's a tough negotiator. She's not giving anything away. And she's not going to sign an agreement for the sake of getting to yes. Serious concerns were expressed here and in Washington that the six-month interim agreement was unwise because Tehran would cheat and the sanctions would begin to unravel. But Iran's nuclear program today is less advanced than it was when the Joint Plan of Action was signed. Certainly less, less than it would have been without the agreement. And while, while many businesses flew to Tehran and tried to find a crack uh, in the sanctions door, the Obama administration continued to vigorously enforce the sanctions and no one has dared step in. The limited sanctions relief offered by the interim agreement has not led to an unraveling of the sanctions and the economic pressure on Iran remains intense. Third, I have no idea whether an agreement will be reached or not. I know there are concerns here that President Obama is too eager to reach one and will cut corners or that he would never use military force against Iran if it acted to develop a nuclear weapon. I disagree with both of those concerns. I do not believe President Obama would accept a nuclear Iran without acting. And any agreement will be intensely scrutinized by the Congress, certainly here, and ultimately by the American people. I don't think an inadequate agreement will pass those tests. But there is one other important dimension I want to emphasize. There are those who would prefer that we wait before making a, trying to negotiate a deal, who are persuaded that by maintaining sanctions a while longer, even tightening them further, 
Iran will surrender. But think about this. How long will the sanctions regime survive if the United States, rather than Iran, were seen as the reason for the enduring crisis? If Iran were able to persuade the international community that it was being reasonable about its nuclear program, and we were not. Yes, time is on our side because each day the sanctions help uh, bind the Iranian economy. But time can be a double-edged sword if the sanctions begin to unravel. Let me turn finally to the tangled web of issues involving Israel and the Palestinians, issues I've worked on since the beginning of the Clinton administration and which you live with every day. Let me start with the lapsed negotiations and then turn briefly to the new PA government. Suspension, pause, collapse, there are a lot of words uh, being used to, uh, to describe where we where we are right now. Uh, frustrations on all sides is understandable, especially after 10 months, countless hours, and extraordinary effort by Secretary Kerry, whom I've known for, for 20 years, and I know for certain is a true friend of Israel, acting out of a genuine desire to see a better, secure future for it. There are many uh, ideas uh, about how we should move forward. As we consider, we need to start by being clear about our larger strategic goals, both for Israel and for the United States. From that vantage point, differences are smaller than they seem. Both have made clear that ultimately they are committed to a two-state solution, not out of some idealistic fantasy, but from a very realistic judgment that is the only way to preserve Israel's nature as a Jewish democratic state. As Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, we don't want a binational state. I don't find the status quo desirable. I believe the Prime Minister is right in both of those sentiments and it is also a strategic imperative for the United States, which is why we have maintained such a sustained focus on Arab-Israeli peacemaking since 19, 1970s. But if that is the larger strategic goal, then anything Israel does in the short or medium term should be consistent with that longer term objective medium-term steps, whether unilateral or otherwise, could change the medium-term realities for better or worse, but they do not fundamentally ch change the long-term uh, uh, calculus under under underlying uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's judgments. And being consistent with that strategic goal is more than saying I am for it. It's not just lip service. It means not closing the door. With annexation of parts of the West Bank, the kind of settlement construction that closes the prospect for a two-state solution, or steps that preclude the possibility of working with or even imagining a Palestinian partner now or in the future. 